Hi everyone, welcome back to another week in Astronomy 322. This week we are talking about stellar populations. Our goal for this week is to go over how a stellar population works and how we can understand its evolution as the sum of the actions of a bunch of individual stars. We're going to start out by discussing the idea of a resolved stellar population, and then we are going to move into the idea of an unresolved stellar population. So without further ado, uh, let's give a little bit of a definition. A resolved stellar population is what we're looking at when we're taking an examination of where individual stars are in their evolution and trying to pick apart a diagram like what we see here. This is the gaia hertzsprung russell diagram from the Gaia collaboration. And they uh, made a plot of all the stars in the solar neighborhood. This does not look like the stellar evolutionary tracks that we saw earlier. Uh, and that's because the stars that we're looking at are all at different ages and different masses. And that gives us a big ensemble of stars in different parts of the HR diagram. So how do we unpick something like this to understand the properties of stars and the star formation history here in the local neighborhood of the Milky Way galaxy? And the key to doing that comes from the study of stellar populations. There's several ingredients that go into stellar pops, uh, and the, we're going to talk about the first three of them today, and then we are going to move on and add in some layers about the star formation history and work on more realistic stellar populations in the following week. Uh, but for now, what we want to talk about is the initial mass function, uh, a bit about the metallicity of the form stars, and then their companion frequencies, all of which contribute to the stars that we see in a typical resolved stellar population. And then we'll talk a little bit about what it means for an unresolved stellar pop. Now, to get started, we have to actually think about where stars come from. And this is a study of something called the initial mass function. It makes this entire process possible, which is figuring out the distribution of masses that are produced when a bunch of stars form. And this seems kind of daunting, but physics and observations give us great insight into uh, the IMF, or this initial mass function. So let's dive into the process of star formation a little bit. Uh, we can actually see stars in the process of forming right now. Uh, this is one of my favorite images of the uh, star formation process. Uh, this is an image taken in the optical of a region called the Perseus Molecular Cloud. And what you see here is basically a bunch of stars in the background and smudges in the foreground. This is the cosmic dust that we talked about last week. Uh, and what you see in this diagram are a bunch of young stars uh, here. So these are known to be young for reasons that we'll discuss in a couple of clusters. And then you see these dark clouds adjacent to them. And these are the dust particles blocking the background light in the optical for the uh, for this system. But if we look at these individual uh, gas clouds here, and we look in a tracer of gas emission, uh, we can actually see what this cloud looks like. And this is the same region now looking in a view of the gas. And so this is showing us that same cloud and those young clusters are located in these uh, spots right next to these dense regions of gas. So what we see here, this molecular cloud is the stellar nursery uh, for uh, star formation. And in studying this over literally decades of work, uh, we've come to conclude that we typically find the youngest stars in gas that has a volume density of hydrogen molecules of about um, 100 million per cubic meter, uh, 10 to the 8th per cubic meter, and a gas temperature of 10 Kelvin. So that's merely 10 degrees above absolute zero. This is some of the coldest, darkest conditions in the universe. And that's where the, uh, that's where the stars are forming. So given this uh, nice gas tracer here, uh, we can start to infer how stars are building up 
in studying the basic physics of that process. And so the next thing to discuss is the idea of how quickly stars form and what are the mass scales, which are things we can derive uh, from physics. And we'll do kind of a back of the envelope scaling to understand that these are about the right scales. So I laid out this case where the stars are forming in this cold, dark molecular gas. And we think that they are forming under the principal action of gravity. So gravity is what holds objects together and makes things into things in astrophysics. So we need to figure out the uh, gravitational forces pulling things down together. But normally what resists gravitational collapse is gas pressure. So gas pressure is pushing back. Uh, and one of the big reasons why we want to go and we want to form stars in molecular clouds is that the temperatures are so low, 10 Kelvin. And therefore the gas temperature being low means that the pressure is low because the gas pressure scales like the temperature of the gas. And so these pressure forces are essentially non-existent in these molecular clouds. Thus, they collapse under the form of gravity and uh, under the force of gravity and nothing is there to really resist it. So they are under what's called a free fall collapse time. Now free fall collapse is what happens if you take a gas cloud and you just ask how long will it take to collapse into the center? It's essentially dropping a mass in a gravitational field and asking how long till it hits the ground. But in this case, it's a self-gravitating cloud, so it needs to actually fall all the way down under its own uh, self-gravity and collapse into the center. I mean, eventually a star forms at the center, but these large kind of tenth of a parsec Cl uh, size clouds, uh, sometimes called ga uh, stellar cores or g molecular gas cores, uh, collapse down to form uh, the individual stars and stellar system. Uh, we can derive, uh, is in the textbook there's some links to a good derivation, uh, that the free fall collapse time for a spherical uniform density cloud has this form, uh, TFF of 3 pi over 32 g rho. I'm not going to go into that derivation, but I want to sort of talk about a little bit about the mechanics of it with an example as we look at this one here, where I'd like to say, okay, what is the free fall collapse time for a typical molecular cloud at this volume particle density. And this is mostly about the mechanics of asking, well, how do I figure out the uh, particle density? So without further ado, let's calculate this a little bit. And so if we say, all right, what is this free fall collapse time uh, at 10 to the eight particles per cubic centimeter? So we say that TFF is equal to root three pi over 32 g rho. Now rho is the mass density and I've been given a particle density so I know that nh2 is equal to 10 to the 8th particles per cubic meter and these are hydrogen molecules per cubic meter and so the mass density is the typical mass of a particle times the number density of the hydrogen molecules. Now the typical mass density of the particle well one hydrogen uh, molecule has uh, two, so a H2 has two MH attached to it. And so the mass of a hydrogen molecule should just be two times the mass of a hydrogen atom. But uh, we also in this gas have helium. And one helium atom has a mass of about four hydrogen masses. And we have a relationship that uh, for every nine, hydrogen molecules, just from the cosmic metal abundance, there are about two helium atoms. And so uh, we look at this and we say, okay, then the typical mass of per hydrogen particle, or per hydrogen molecule, is that two uh, uh, hydrogen masses, and that's from the particle itself, and then we get, uh, for every single molecule, we get two ninths of a helium atom. So that's the a mass of a helium. And I can then replace this with, let me stick consistently with colors, that is going to have a mass of four hydrogen masses. 
And so then the total mass is about 2.9 hydrogen masses per hydrogen molecule. So this uh, just gives us a little bit of a correction factor. If you choose different abundances and uh, chemical compositions accounting for other trace molecules, you get slightly different numbers. Uh, but for our purposes, we now know that we should be relating the mass density to the number density in terms of this mass per hydrogen particle. So therefore, we can now return to our original expression and start plugging in some numbers. So I'm going to say, what is this? T free fall is going to be uh, 3 pi divided by, all in brackets, uh, 32 times g, which is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 meter cubed per kilogram second squared. And then I'm going to multiply that by my mass density, which is 2.9 times a hydrogen mass, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilos. So far, so good. And then uh, we'll take that and we will multiply it by our number density. So that is a 10 to the 8 uh, um, particles per meter cubed. And then we have everything we want in the denominator. And then we're going to take that all to the 1 half power. And when I go ahead and do that, I come up with a number that is about uh, 9 point, uh, uh, 9.5 times 10 to the, uh, looks like 13, and that's seconds because we're in SI units. And then we can then convert that to a useful unit. Uh, often we see... Uh, so if we want things in mega years or giga years, and the closest unit that we have is that um, one mega year is 3.16 times 10 to the 13 seconds. And then these will all cancel out and we'll get a number that is about um, 3.0 mega years. So that will give me uh, a good characteristic scale for my value. So for uh, 10 to the eighth particle per cubic centimeter hydrogen gas, the free fall time is three mega years. And I just wanted to note that I like to always write, write things in terms of their um, kind of engineering formulas. So I do everything in sort of scaled units when I report it in the book and stuff. So then I will often write this as 3.0 mega years and then I'm going to look at the things that can vary. And I see that the mass density here, uh, up here at the top, is going to uh, vary like the number density. And it's going to appear in the negative square root. So I can say that I calculated that for 10 to the 8th particles per centimeter cube. So I can scale the actual answer, NH2, uh, to 10 to the 8th particles per meter cube. That's hydrogen molecules. Uh, and then that's going to be raised to the minus one half because that's the value that was the density was showing up in in the original formula. So now I have a nice engineering formula uh, version uh, for this. So you just calculate it for a given number and then figure out the things you want to vary and stick that variation into your scaling formula. So that gives us a good approach and say it takes about three mega years or three million years for a star to collapse inside a molecular cloud. So that gives us a sense of the scale of the problem. Okay, so we know it takes about three mega years to collapse. Well, how much stuff collapses in that three mega year? I really hope it's around the mass of a star. That would be very reasonable. Uh, so the way we calculate that is through the estimate of something that's called the genes mass. And this sort of walks through uh, how we uh, come up with an answer for what the genes mass is. Uh, what we do is we take that free fall time and we say essentially that's the amount of gas that it would, uh, or that's the amount of time it would take for gas to fall down and collapse. And now we want to know how much gas could collapse. And we're going to basically race this collapse against the force of pressure. Uh, and the way we evaluate the force of pressure is we say, well, pressure will only stop the collapse if 
it can communicate that there is sufficient gas pressure to halt the collapse before the collapse happens. And the way uh, a gas communicates that there's a change in pressure or a change in its configuration is through a sound wave. So when we have a, uh, a change in pressure, that drives a sound wave into the gas, and that ends up creating, uh, basically saying, there's pressure forces here, let's halt the collapse. So what we want to do is essentially say, we want the gravitational collapse to kind of get away with it on a free fall time and do that before the pressure realizes that anything is up. And so what we do is we set the free fall time equal to the amount of time it would take in the system for a pressure wave to move across it and say, whoa, 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 there's, there's pressure here, stop collapsing. And so if we equate the free fall time with the crossing time for a sound wave, we will derive kind of a characteristic length scale that can collapse uh, before the uh, gravitational or the gravitational force is halted by pressure. Uh, so the amount of time it takes for a sound wave to move across is just how big the system is divided by the speed of sound. And we're going to use an isothermal speed of sound. So that's what we have here. So we have a free fall collapse time, uh, which we sort of uh, were working with in the previous slide. And then we're going to equate that with a crossing time. And so that's uh, given as the um, uh, scale that we care about. We'll call that the gene's length. That's what we're actually solving for. And we're going to divide that by the sound speed, uh, Cs. And so C sub s we're going to use as root kt over the mass of a given particle. Talked a lot about that last time. Uh, and so that root kt over m is the isothermal version, uh, essentially saying that we're going to propagate a sound wave at that speed through it. So we're going to say, okay, if these two crossing times are equal, then this is the size scale of object that can collapse. So we'll set them equal and we'll solve to get the, um, the gene scale uh, where L sub J is 3 pi KT over 32 GM rho. And you'll notice that this is just the free fall time, essentially times the sound speed squared, uh, all raised to the one half. And then we multiply that MJ uh, to get MJ, which is what's called the genes math, which is the mass density, all showing up in here, times this gene scale cubed. So essentially it's a cube uh, of length LJ. Uh, and that gives us a answer with the right scalings. It gives us uh, speed of light cu uh, speed of sound cubed uh, divided by g to the three halves rho to the one half, and then some number that is incorrect, uh, but it's not very incorrect. And if you do this in about two hours more time, you get a slightly different constant. And that's really all you get by uh, doing it. And if you use that constant and you, you, you plug it in here and get the same engineering formula, you get the answer that I have here. So 6.9 uh, solar masses uh, times temperature to the three halves times the hydrogen, de uh, molecule, uh, hydrogen molecule density scaled to this 10 to the eight per cubic meter all raised to the minus one half power. Uh, so this gives us the characteristic genes mass uh, for the system. Now, small pedantic point, which is uh, genes has no apostrophe in it. The human being who created this was named genes. And so the name genes uh, has no apostrophe in it. So if you actually want to refer to this human's mass, uh, it would have little genes apostrophe s in there. but. Uh, so genes is mass, but uh, just so you know. Uh, anyways, this kind of tells us the characteristic scale of objects that are going to collapse. Uh, it's about seven solar masses, and so star formation should form objects with a characteristic uh, scale of seven solar masses. Well, what does it do? Star formation is complicated, and there's a lot of physics that goes on in star formation. So people have to use computers to model it. And this is a model. So what we're gonna do is take a look at the process of star formation. This is a few minute long movie and I'm gonna give a narration through it. But first I wanna give a big shout out to the collaboration who built this. Uh, this uh, is work primarily led by um, Mike Grudick 
and it's the Star Forge collaboration. So it's a group of amazing theorists who are running a bunch of numerical simulations, uh, and they're actually simulating the process of star formation. And what you're seeing here is the collapse of a molecular cloud. And you'll notice first that it's all kind of churny and everything is like spinning around in here. And that's because the collapse of this gas is turbulent in that the motions are moving faster than the speed of sound. So this creates turbulent shock waves as it undergoes a gravitational collapse. So that's one deviation from the simple physics that we assume. The second deviation that we see is starting to show up here. And that is we see these individual little stars starting to form uh, here. And you'll notice that they're spitting off stuff. This sort of looks like they're going out into the interstellar space. These are called protostellar outflows. And protostellar outflows churn up uh, the gas. It's a consequence of material accreting onto a star. And as the gravitational collapse really starts to spin things up, uh, that leads to uh, material being shot out into space along these bipolar jets. We see the same thing in galaxies, as we talked about last week. Uh, it's a phenomenon of magnetized gas collapsing down into a small compact object. We'll get into more details on jets a little later in the course, but right now that's the second departure from the simple physics uh, that we have. And so that it is a part of the process that shapes uh, the characteristic object scales uh, that we see are these protostellar jets. And I put a pause on it here, mostly because I also wanted to call your attention to these expanding shells around some of the forming stars. Those expanding shells are radiation fields. And so the radiation starts to carve up and reshape and heat up the molecular gas here. Uh, and so we see a third departure from the simple physics of, oh, it's just a collapsing gas cloud. But you see the action of gravity is pulling all of this gas, gas down to form stars and then turbulence, radiation fields, uh, and the uh, radiation fields and the action of outflows is reshaping uh, the gas around it and setting a lot of the physics of how an individual star and star cluster is forming. And so here we're kind of rotating in three-dimensional space around the star cluster and it's starting to carve out the natal cloud. So the original molecular cloud that hosted all of the star formation is getting disrupted by this young cluster of stars that's hosted inside it. So there are, uh, what we're seeing is the action of what's called protostellar feedback, where uh, these high mass, uh, where the high mass stars and the outflows from the system start to carve out the cloud, disrupt, and ultimately halt the process of star formation. Um, this leads to an exciting consequence of star formation, namely star formation is very inefficient Efficient. And so when it's so, in, oh, and what we mean is that we start out with a big massive cloud and we only get about 1% of the mass of the cloud into stars for every free fall collapse time. So uh, this is um, a, a sort of an amazing consequence of star formation physics. And this is what we care about when we're actually doing research in star formation. So it's an amazing movie. I'll have some links in the book uh, and uh, a couple other resources if you want to go and watch the rest of their movies. It gives a great intuition for the process of star formation. So uh, yeah, go check it out. So all this giant mess of physics associated with star formation actually produces a distribution of masses of stars. And we'd like to actually go out and measure it and compare the models of star formation on one hand to the observations out in space in the other. So what we have is the stars in a system like this. And the problem is that these are what are called the field stars. And they've been affected by a lot of stellar evolution. Uh, so the high mass stars have evolved quickly off the main sequence, undergone supernova, died off. Low mass stars are basically here from the beginning of the universe down till now. And so the trick is we don't really know how to measure an initial mass function uh, until we start to look at regions where we think that all the stars 
have the same age. And those are clusters of stars. We think they are all formed together in what's called a simple stellar population. So we'll take the, uh, when we look at clusters uh, in uh, examine the mass distributions there, we can try to figure out what a mass function looks like. And if we examine a bunch of uh, different star uh, clusters uh, around the galaxy and try to make a measurement of what their mass function is, we find out that surprisingly, all of these mass functions are pretty similar. In fact, I think the way to put it is they are more the same than they are different, though there is some evidence that there are variations in the initial mass function. Uh, this is a nice review article by Nate Bastian and team, and they uh, assembled several different mass functions uh, of stars. And so what you're seeing on the horizontal axis is the logarithm of the stellar mass, and on the vertical axis is the number of stars found in bins of mass, and they've been shifted by a constant so they can all be kind of compared to each other. Uh, this is also on a logarithmic scale. And they all kind of have this kind of turn over and they fit this dotted line shape. So uh, yeah, seems pretty reasonable. These are older populations. They also seem to have kind of a common mass function. Here's the Pleiades that we've been studying. Um, and this distribution of masses, this is a probability density function of masses, all seems to be somewhat similar. And so we call this, once we factor out the process of stellar evolution and correct for older populations missing some stars at their upper mass end, we come up with what's called the initial mass function. Uh, the first person to do this was named Saul Peter. So the first Saul, uh, first IMF that we'll study is the Saul Peter IMF, uh, and this is practically uh, what uh, this initial mass function looks like. Uh, so we write it in this form of dn by dm, where uh, dn by dm is a function over here on the left side, on the right side, and this c star is a constant, and that constant depends on the star formation event of the population we're considering. And then the uh, m to the minus 2.35 is the shape of the function. It's often called the functional form of the IMF. And it's a differential relationship, and m here is the mass of the stars normalized to the solar mass, and n is the number of stars. And so it's the number of stars in a bin of mass width uh, dm as a function of the uh, stellar mass. And practically what that looks like is a little function like this, where this is the log of the stellar mass and solar mass units. And then the number is uh, here in these small little mass bins. And what it sort of shows, uh, a nice little figure, showing what this means uh, where there's very few high mass stars, and that's shown in mathematically with n getting large, it drops off by this index, minus 2.35, and sort of falls down uh, quickly. So there's very few high mass stars, and there's a lot of low mass stars. And so that's the basic mechanics of what uh, IMF is supposed to look like. So uh, this can be kind of daunting. We're like, what is going on? It's probably a density function. How can we use this? Well, let's do a couple examples to illustrate exactly how uh, the IMF uh, shapes up. So uh, let's take a pause and I will get into creating uh, some IMF examples. 